It's the Bits and Pieces podcast. Hello and welcome to April 2024 Bits and Pieces. I'm here with my indie podcaster, James. How are you doing, James? Oh, not so bad. Yourself? Yeah, been a busy uh, busy old week with what we believe in Scotland March, which we will touch on in this podcast. We don't always have a theme to these bits and pieces, but this month there is slightly a theme that's been emerging, which is mainstream media, our nemesis, the twisting and the slanting of stories. It has felt this month there's a, a real onslaught. Now, whether it's Holyrood, whether it's Westminster, whether it's papers, whether it's TV, I can only conclude that the independence figures must be really, really good to have them all in such a panic. To use their own line, I think that's just their day job at this point. I'm not sure it's because they perceive any threat. They've just got a very strict set of rules. And one of them is Scotland never looks good. <laughs> there was an example this morning of uh, Laura Maxwell, the BBC Scotland, Michelle Ballantyne, one, one of your SMP, uh, MSPs here, has described the Greens as science deniers. Now, Michelle Ballantyne was a Scottish Tory. She was a very far right Scottish Tory. The Scottish Tories weren't far right enough for her. So she jumped ship and went to Reform UK. Well, either it's incompetence, a basic lack of research, or it's just reading out today's attack lines. John Nicholson. I think you know how I feel about GB News, the right wing channel which spreads disinformation. Well, the good news is that the independent media regulator Ofcom has ruled against against the channel and has said that Tory MPs can't be newsreaders there, as I always said they shouldn't be. Have a listen to my question. The media regulator Ofcom has again reprimanded GB News for breaching impartiality rules. Ofcom says news programmes should not be presented by politicians. Now, the Tory benches host a plethora of Ofcom rule-breaching MPs who leave this place to freelance as pretending news presenters on a channel which spreads conspiracy theories, disinformation and which undermines Ofcom. I'm on the side of journalism, not disinformation. Does the Minister agree with me that GB News should drop the propaganda and obey the regulator? Listen to all the howling and faux outrage from Tory MPs all supporting GB News. But what about the Secretary of State? Would she back journalism and the regulator Ofcom? Listen to her answer. She doesn't. I'm in favour of media plurality and I think it's important that there are channels for everybody uh, to watch and GB News is a very popular outlet and I think the person to regulate GB News is Ofcom and not those shadow benches. So there you go. This is an example of a minister twisting what was said. She'd just been told that Ofcom has ruled against what the Tory MPs are doing and she's saying, no, 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 it's fine, GB News Lots of people listen to it. We'll let Ofcom decide. Ofcom have decided and they've decided it's wrong. So either she's not listened to the question or she has deliberately twisted it to mean the opposite. This weekend was the, the Believe in Scotland rally in Glasgow. I was there. Marlene, our indie podcaster colleague, was standing next to Martin Comston and Pat Kane holding the banner all the way. She's on the front page of the National. So go Marlene. I was at the Yes Stones stall. Overall, it was a really positive, joyful march. It wasn't the biggest that we've had in Glasgow by any means. And I do think there is a real issue with getting the message out there that these things are happening because... Facebook, in particular, just appears to have completely pulled the plug on any kind of whatever they badge as political. The national newspaper, which is our only media outlet that, <laughs> that covers anything that's happening in Scotland to, to do with the independent side. But even in that, we had a spat between Gordon McIntyre Kemp, who organised the Believe in Scotland march, and Neil Mackay, who organises the All Under One Banner marches. So the two of them had in the paper an exchange of views, let's call it. Who's right, who knows? But it certainly doesn't make the movement look as if it's working together. The thing that the independence movement wants, second only to independence, is independence from itself. <laughs> <laughs> is we are a unique and individualistic bunch and we all have our own ways of saying this is how it should be done and unfortunately it does tend to mean that we chafe up against each other when we're trying to do something good. My other point on that is more to do with the way news is at the moment. Just following the trend, even the indie positive news sources report this way, but it is kind of almost that gossip column-esque reporting of it's not really news, but 
a bit of a ruffling of feathers here. We should probably just see if we can get this in here. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, like normally, especially if you're indie supporting, you wouldn't really bother reporting on just minor internal conflict between two people, both of whom just say, I can do better marches than you can. But that's just kind of how news is these days. One of the speakers who I thought had a really good point was Jane McAllister who did the film To See Ourselves which was all about the uh, 2014 campaign. And my worry is that people who believe in the union don't want us to be proud of that peaceful movement for change in 2014 and they don't want us to be proud of our civic nationalism as opposed to ethnic nationalism. They don't want to be pr us to be proud of our moral cause our socialist values, our distinct Scottish culture. And the reason they don't want us to be proud is because when we're proud, we're confident and we know where that's going to lead. If they cover us doing something well, then there's a danger that we'll get confident in what we're doing. And if they cover us in a negative way, it's trying to undermine any confidence we've got. I mean, I, I think what Jane's saying there is almost certainly right. And we almost walk into it for ourselves because there's also a spat between Alba and the Greens. Greens won't share a platform with Alba. So whoever's putting on a march has a dilemma as to, well, who do I invite first? It just seems a really childish position for the Greens to take, in my opinion. The better thing to do would be to turn up and put a better argument. Yeah, I don't know that I agree with that necessarily. I Ooh, mean, <laughs> conflict. Go on, let's have a... <laughs> well, it's sort of something to have the courage of your convictions. We've taken a stance on this and we're going to stick to it. When they could be spending that time doing something productive. Yeah, I would also say, you know what? We'll cut the losses on this one. That's a perfectly reasonable alternative view. It's almost like a split personality for the Yes movement because on the one hand, you've got the Believe in Scotland march deliberately being positioned as a celebration, a festival of independence. We're going to celebrate our Scottishness and focusing on culture, and it, it did feel that way. But then on the other hand, the last couple of All and One Banner ones, the tone of the speeches has been angry and, and frustrated, and that's a legitimate position as well, because if you feel that you're not getting anywhere or aren't doing the right things, then yes, you should be angry. But if you have to choose between, I don't know, maybe it would be better somehow putting those two things together. Well, it's harnessing two different forces, whereas if you could indeed get a harmony between those two, unfortunately, at the moment, it is very much two disparate camps. The ironic thing is that I find it perfectly natural to, at the same time, love the positivity of the Believe in Scotland march and feel that optimism and the, the, the possibilities of what we could be as an independent country, whilst also being annoyed at the lack of progress, frustrated at the barriers that are in our way, wishing that our government would be a bit bolder and a bit braver and a bit more confrontational with Westminster. So I can have those feelings quite happily coexisting within me. Why we have to separate them out into two separate marches, I'm not sure. Maybe because at the end of the day, everybody on those marches wants independence. They just disagree about what's the best way to get there. Well, yeah, you have to take the big grand strategic picture of a beautiful future and distill that into actionable things that people can do and then that gets the crowd that wants to do things now motivated. Yeah. We could not possibly put out the Bits and Pieces podcast without including a clip of indie podcaster Marlene's speech. We're showbiz now. We are. For every pensioner who wants Scotland to be independent, there are two pensioners out there who want to stay in the UK. But... For those of you who are 16, 25, 30, for you it's completely the other way round. More than two thirds of you want Scotland to be independent. So look, and well done guys. So listen, we need to start talking to each other. Folk my age need to start talking to you and vice versa. How about we set up some sort of cross-generation conversation project? And you know, in Ireland, when they were making changes to their constitution, just imagine they've got a constitution written down. They can make changes to it. But the, the young folk phoned up the older folk and they helped them to come round to what the changes that they were wanting to make. So. Yeah, if you're in that younger age group, yeah, yeah, of course, talk to your grandparents, but talk to your grandparents' pals. If you've got an elderly neighbour, help them take their bins out. 
help them get their messages up the stairs and the lifts, because I tell you, it's always really appreciated if you do that kind of thing. Get chatting to them. Tell them why Scotland being an independent nation is important to you. Right. Tell them what a difference you think it would make to you, but also tell them what a difference it would make to them. Point them to Pensioners for Indie Groups, point them to our, our, our website, and when you've had a go at that a few times and you've found out the kind of things that can persuade older people, well, then you need to get your message out to a wider audience. And at that point, get in touch with me. Come and talk to us at Scottish Independence Podcast. Or, or talk to the Broadcasting Scotland people. Or write something for the National. So we need you younger folk to give folk my age a nudge. Just persuade some of those maybe's I, maybe's no pensioner to give you futures a bit more weight than they are doing at the moment. And then listen, in return, we're going to give you a nudge. Because you, you younger folk, yeah, you're convinced about independence, but you're not so good at actually going out and voting for it. See us. We're really good at voting out for voting for it. So well said, Marlene. I don't know if you could hear in the background there, there was whistling. That was coming from a small group of Union Jack waving thugs, I'm going to call them. That's certainly how they look to me. Luckily, they were sort of corralled in the far corner of the square. But they just stood there with whistles and they must have been exhausted by the end. Their poor little unionist lungs must have been gasping because they blew those whistles through the entire speeches, through the songs, everything. A couple of them also took their flag and their whistle and went wandering in the crowd, sort of blowing their whistle in people's faces. The entire crowd just ignored them, just let them carry on. So they didn't get what they wanted. But what was quite interesting, there was a film crew over from the Netherlands. I was interviewed by them. And in the interests of balance, <laughs> having interviewed the people on the independence side, they went over to the group of the Union Jack Waivers and asked them why they were there. And they came back over later and said to me, oh, we didn't get anything usable there. They, they couldn't explain why they were there. They just were making noise. And I thought, well, doesn't that just sum up the face of the union for us? Gordon McIntyre Kemp was doing the round of media to publicise the march, which was great. We, we had him on our podcast twice, I think. He also was on Broadcasting Scotland's very good Sunday show, Full Scottish. And they asked Gordon his thoughts on the recent airstrikes that the RAF have just been involved in on Iran who were firing drones at Israel. Gordon managed not only to have an opinion on that, but to turn it into a positive argument for independence. What did worry me about the situation is watching the immediate launch of British RAF planes to actually help shoot down these drones. Now, whereas you could say from a humanitarian point of view that, that we should do that wherever we have the opportunity, if indeed we had a conventional force that was capable of doing that and we don't. But it just seems as if there was an immediate knee-jerk reaction to that, which uh, wasn't discussed in Parliament, uh, which Israel seems to have significantly better protection from the Western world than a lot of other players do who maybe deserve it more. That's a, a serious issue as far as I can see. Well, I think that's a, a very good point, and I, I would certainly draw the parallels between swift knee-jerk reaction to deploying the RAF to bomb Yemen as well. Again, as you say, without debate in Parliament, without any clear statement on an actual strategic goal. Joining in yeah. largely with American efforts, but with no clear uh, idea of how that actually makes the UK any safer. Well, I think the, the key issue here is that an independent Scotland would have a conventional force that would be focused on protecting the peace around the world, on aid missions and on peace missions. And uh, as part of the UK, it's not about protecting peace, it's about projecting power and pretending we have more power than we actually have. Uh, and that, for me, is the big defence change that independence will actually bring for Scottish people fantastic soundbite you came up with there. It's not about protecting peace, it's about projecting power. Author James Robertson was also uh, one of the speakers at the rally and he had uh, actually a really funny 
take on our issue with the news. Now it's time for the news where you are. The news where you are comes after the news where we are. The news where we are is the news. It comes first. The news where you are is the news where you are. It comes after. We do not have the news where you are. The news where you are may be news to you, but is not news to us. The news may be international, national, or regional. The news where we are may be international news. The news where you are is never international news. Where you are is not international. The news where you are comes after the international and national news. The news where you are may be national news or regional news. However, national news where you are is not national news where we are. It is the news where you are. If the news where you are is national news, it is only national where you are. The news where we are is national wherever you are. On Saturdays, there is no news where you are after the news where we are. In fact, there is no news where you are on Saturdays. Any news there is, is not where you are, it is where we are. If there is news where you are, but not where we are, it'll wait until Sunday. It's only because of the independent media that that went out at all, because there was no coverage on by the BBC. There was no coverage by STV. As I said, there was a Dutch film crew there. There was quite a few photographers. But Independence Live runs on an absolute shoestring. Most of us give our time for free. Uh, we need the odd little bit of equipment here and there. But in um, particular, Independence Live, who covered the whole event, are doing a crowdfunder at the moment. So I popped in at the end of the march and interviewed Kevin Gibney from Independence Live to let him tell us about his crowdfunder. That was fantastic and always a few wobbles with the live streams and at the end it happened again and we have been doing Hoomsa's speech. Good job of recording it. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> Let's just shout out to all the volunteers for making Independence Live work. How many have you had today, Les? Uh, how many? There was, I don't know how many, but 10? Yeah, all day. That's right, we did a drone, drone at the start, live streaming, and I managed to grab that and, and put it into a stream. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a great effort, as always. The crowdfunder launched, I think, three days ago. As always, right, I, I never have the time to promote these things. And uh, yeah, so if you can help, please, please do it because uh, we're seriously short in front again. And you know, everything you do helps. We've got online shows, we've got all these services, you know, so um, it keeps us going. You know, it does, it really does, it really helps us, right? Because we've got no other media, we've got none. You know, I had 2, 214, there was nothing there apart from like me and Derek at the time. Right, not even knowing what we're doing, live streaming, walking about with iPads and stuff, you know. So and here we are now. The times that you know people are giving me lift to events and Edinburgh and stuff. I, I don't drive, so I, I, it's an effort by everybody. We want independence, right? You know, we want to do it in uh, you know a peaceful way, right? And that's the way we can try and get it out to people as best we can. We do follow us on YouTube. Facebook has died totally died for other indie people as well yeah. that used to be the most important place to stream to and then it just dropped as if they just pulled the plug oh please do any yeah, come do. on support the crowdfunder yeah. please exactly. we really need it you'll be here for at least an hour probably half hour to an hour yeah. won't you so if you'd like to make a donation to the crowdfunder to help keep independence live go on the website independencelive.net slash crowdfunder and you can donate much or as little as you like. Please do consider just getting involved in the indie media yourself. Pick up a camera, make some videos. Please just make sure you keep boosting the signal on any indie media that does come out. Repost things, like, favourite, subscribe. We'll put the link to the crowdfunder in the notes below and if, if you can help out, that would be great. Now, we are going to have a podcast special with all the speeches from the Believe in Scotland rally. That'll probably be next week. 
You're listening to Bits and Pieces. Let's move on to Holyrood, where the twisting and mischief-making continues. Let's start with the hate crimes bill, which, as everybody will know, came in on the 1st of April, was immediately seized upon by far-right activists in England. The role of the Scottish Tories, I think, is a disgrace. Here's perpetually angry Russell Findlay doing his best to, ironically, stir up hatred. (laughs) Uh, Police Scotland has been bombarded with almost 9,000 reports because of Hamza Yusuf's hate crime law, a law that threatens free speech and a law that is critically different to competent legislation elsewhere in the UK, despite the SNP spin that we've just heard. The vast majority of these 9,000 reports are not crimes. Despite the SNP's best efforts, Scotland is not suffering from a hate epidemic. It's suffering from bad SNP legislation. And the Cabinet Secretary... The Cabinet Secretary talks about misinformation. What an absolute brass neck. The misinformation has come from her government, including Hamza Youssef and the Community Safety Minister. They misquote their own legislation, confusing the public and fueling even more complaints to police. And police officers are paying the price for this absolute shambles. As a new HMICS report confirms, they already feel unsafe and unable to do their jobs. Yet the SNP is now ordering these exhausted police officers to police our speech. The government was repeatedly warned that their law was unworkable and would be weaponised. They didn't listen to us. They didn't listen to anyone else. Neither did Labour nor the Lib Dems. So will they now listen, admit that they got it wrong and back our demand to scrap Hamza Yusuf's hate crime law. Presiding officer, bearing in mind we want to have a debate that's rooted in facts and respect, may I respectfully remind Mr Finlay that it is this Parliament's hate crime legislation. It's this Parliament. 82 members in this Parliament voted to modernise and update our laws to protect those at the sharp end day in, day out of hate crime in this country. And I, for one, will not turn uh, a blind eye to hate crime or to the victims that suffer uh, at the hands of those who perpetrate hate. Now, I'm very clear, presiding officer, about my own responsibilities, and I do uh, wonder if all members uh, reflect uh, strongly on their responsibilities because in this Parliament we should be united on two things irrespective of our views on any piece of legislation. Firstly, we should be united on the evils of hate crime and the corrosive effect it has on individuals, families and communities the length and breadth of Scotland. And secondly, we should be united and on the same script, Mr Finlay, and strongly calling an discouraging people from wasting uh, police time. And and it is not not acceptable for members of the Conservative Party to be democracy deniers. This legislation was subject this legislation was subject to very careful scrutiny indeed and some excellent cross-party working, some of which uh, his own members contributed to, to make an act that was strong, that was defensible, compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights, and most of all, protects victims of hate crimes, whilst also protecting the rights of freedom of expression. So that, that was a cracking response from Angela Constance, wasn't it? And as Humsey Youssef explained for about the two dozenth time. But unless your behaviour is threatening or abusive and intends to start up hatred, then you have nothing to worry about in terms of the new offences being created. If your behaviour is threatening or abusive and does intend to start up hatred against Jews or Muslims or disabled people or gay people, then I think we should the law should protect those people uh, from uh, who are the victims of that potential hatred. That is the bottom line, isn't it? And if, when you've got people like Elon must JK Rowling lining up with the Tories to make mischief and spread disinformation, which is what they appear to be doing to me, you have to wonder why are you so adamant that you have the right to threaten, abuse and stir up hatred against minority groups? How is that a good look? Now, on to the next clip, which is, I think, a nice contrast from harsh words to kind words. Jim Fairley was asked a question about flood 
prevention planning. And he took the opportunity to say something kind. We will discuss all of these issues at the Flood Forum, which I've, I've already um, stated. But the, the point I'm going to make to, to Willa Rennie is that where we are right now is in a season which has been absolutely horrendous for the farming community. It has been absolutely brutal. The spring has been horrendous. Um, so I'm going to make a couple of points, if you don't mind, presiding officer. It's to say to the farming community, please stay connected and talk to friends and family. Because mental health right now is absolutely at its lowest ebb through a lack of sleep, very long tiring hours, and nature absolutely doing her damnedest to test every nerve and sinew. And it's a feeling that I'm very well acquainted with. And it's for that reason I went to help a friend at the weekend in a lambing shed, not for the physical work aspect of it, but in order to make sure that he had somebody else that he could talk to. We understand that these flooding issues are a problem, but we are take, tackling them and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we help give that mental uh, support to the farming community. So if people are finding it hard and they need someone else to talk to about the problems that they're facing just now, I would direct them to the RSABI who are doing amazing work in keeping folks' spirits up and giving practical help and advice on most situations and they're available seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So please do not feel as though you're on your own, that there is actually help out there. So the organisation that um, Jim mentioned there, RSABI, you can find it at rsabi.org.uk and they have a helpline which is 0808 1234 555. This next clip, I tuned into it because it was to do with the Scottish Land Register and Alex Cole Hamilton had a question and this is not at all the question <laughs> that I saw coming. The Register of Persons Holding a Controlled Interest in Land, known as the RCI, is maintained by the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland. The RCI went live on the 1st of April 2022 with a two-year transitional period before the offence provisions for non-compliance took effect. As of the 12th of April this year, 12 days after the end of the transitional period, there were 5,438 entries on the RCI and a further 10,273 entries have been submitted and are pending publication as details are not published until 30 days after submission to the register. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful indeed for that reply. Uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine on a full-scale basis in 2022, there was rightly a focus on the Russian oligarchs who own land in Scotland. We know of four, at least two of whom have links to the Kremlin and were included on the Putin list published by the US Treasury Department in 2018. However, there is a loophole in the register, which means that some landowners are exempt from it, which could mean that there are still landowners hiding their identity and potential wealth and may have links to Putin's kleptocracy. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether she is satisfied with the system as it exists today and what plans the government has to further increase transparency around this issue? I think this is an area, well first of all I think the measures that we've introduced are very important but I think as with anything I think as we see how this progresses I think if there are any improvements uh, to be made to the system then of course more than open to looking at what they may look like or to indeed engage with the the member on these discussions. I know that this is an area of interest for the member and I think in previous responses I've also outlined that we had fully supported the UK-wide emergency legislation that had been uh, introduced on the UK Economic Crime Act uh, which was about the, the register of overseas uh, entities as well. I believe we are making strong progress when it comes to this but again more than happy to keep this under review. Moving on, wood burning stoves. There's another massive issue that blew up out of nowhere, it seems. In this clip, we've got Rachel Hamilton making a whole load of unfounded allegations and Minister Patrick Harvey doing his best to disabuse her of them. Thank the Minister for that answer. He may not know this, but rural communities across Scotland rely on wood-burning stoves to heat their homes as they did during Storm Arwen in particular. This poorly thought-out ban has been criticised by the Western Isles Council, an SNP, MSP and even a former Scottish Green MSP, with rural areas already suffering from population decline. Why is the Minister hell-bent on making it even more difficult to eat, heat new homes? Minister. Well, naturally, I uh, reject the characterisation uh, in the member's question. In fact, we consulted extensively uh, with rural stakeholders, including rural local authorities, in the development of this uh, instrument uh, over a number of years and two formal consultation 
processes. Uh, I, I'm a little surprised uh, that the member uh, makes the question in the way that she does, given that her own party colleague on committee uh, also agreed to that unanimous support for the new build heat standard, a measure which has been praised by the UK Climate Change Committee, who urged the UK Government to accelerate their action in this area to match our timetable. Rachel Hamilton. Uh, Whilst a a clause was secured referring to emergency heating, which permits alternative heat um, sources as a backup in off-grid situations, this doesn't extend to stoves, Minister Harvey. And the answer that you gave actually shows the SNP and Greens' ignorance of this particular situation and the needs of Scots living outside the central belt. The Minister may not be banning stoves in existing homes today, but the Government is currently consulting on doing just that. And as well as reversing the ban on new builds, while the Minister um, must rule out subjecting rural communities to even harsher winters by ruling out this outright ban on wood burning stoves. And will he do that and commit to it? Minister. Well, uh, as well as being slightly at a loss as to why the member uh, appears uh, unwilling to engage with the fact that her own party colleague uh, supported this instrument in committee, I am disappointed that she is choosing to misrepresent the government's position in the entirely separate consultation on the Heat in Buildings Bill, which does not set out a proposal for an outright ban on existing uh, biomass heating systems or their installation in existing homes. In fact, it specifically asks questions about the additional flexibility that might be required in those circumstances, specifically to deal with some of the uh, instances of uh, the experience of rural communities that the member mentions. It is very clear that the new build heat standard, alongside high energy efficiency standards for for new build, are necessary to drive down carbon emissions, uh, and we are convinced that we can do that in a way that also tackles fuel poverty for all of Scotland's communities and stimulating the development of a clean heat supply chain in Scotland. It is opposition's job to oppose. Questioning and subjecting draft legislation to scrutiny is a good thing because it results in better legislation at the end of the day. But I think this has to be a process that you enter into in good faith. That's two examples we've had today, Russell Finlay and now Rachel Hamilton. They are not entering into it in good faith, it seems to me. They are twisting what they know to be the case to score points. I go back to the committees at Holyrood because those are cross-party committees. Some of them are chaired by Tories, others are chaired by Labour, and they are working together on particular topics. The Net Zero Committee, chaired by a Tory, Edward Mountain. The heating bill has been discussed. It's been through there. And the Hate Crimes Act um, was discussed in the Justice Committee, which has got Tories on it. So they have been able to work collaboratively in a committee to come up with constructive amendments to improve the legislation, which is good. But then they go into the debating chamber and start throwing around all sorts of scaremongering and allegations for the sake of attacking, which leaves the ministers having to defend. And that is not opposing for the sake of improving the legislation. It's opposing for the purpose of undermining the government's position. Well, yeah, it's using a democratic mechanism. They're effectively transforming a democratic mechanism into a debate club. Their intention is that, yes, their argument somehow at the end will be graded and they will be told, you won. You won that debate. (laughs) Surely the basic premise must be that what you say is true. Debating on the basis of fabrications and mischaracterizations, how does that have any integrity if you win by using those tactics? Well, that's my point. If your only objective is to win the argument and be seen as the victor of the debate, then yeah, you'll do whatever it takes. And as we've seen just there, but the way it's supposed to play out is indeed you as opposition come forward and express reasonable doubts and queries as to how you think a particular issue or piece of legislation is going to affect either your constituents or the nation as a whole. And then the party in power goes, ah, right, that's a valid point. We will make considerations about that. However, at the moment, we would refute point A, B and C, etc. But that's just not how it is, right? You're right. And you have to question whether their constituents' needs remotely feature in their thinking when what they're actually doing is stirring up fear amongst their constituents by pretending that something awful is going to happen to them, which isn't. You're listening to Bits and Pieces. 
the Scottish Government's much celebrated world leading green climate targets have been under scrutiny as well this month. The reason the 2030 target was set at the level it was, was because all the opposition parties got together and demanded that it should be set higher. So let's just remind ourselves of why they thought that was a good idea back then. The opposition parties came to agree that the SNP's proposal for the 2030 target at 70%, only a few degrees up from what it was back, uh, back in 2009, wasn't good enough. I came to submit 75 for stage three in the hope that it would be a place of consensus in the midpoint of the fair shares calculation, coming down from our own Scottish Labour higher initial position of 77. I believe that setting a target of 70% reduction in emissions by 2030 is inadequate. It represents only a marginal increase over what was set in the 2009 Act. But I believe 75% sets the right balance. It is stretching. It will be extremely challenging, but it is achievable. The reality is that caution and pragmatism and while I understand that those are the considerations of the way that government must be done in normal times and normal issues, cannot be the way that we approach dealing with climate change. We have to listen to the people that we must achieve, not just uh, strive for net zero, strive for 75% reduction by 2030, not even 80% reduction, but those calls saying that we must achieve net zero by 2030. We must listen to those. And now that this bill has been strengthened through committee amendments at stage two, stage three amendments, I believe that this legislation will be the springboard to ensure that Scotland continues to lead the way on tackling climate change now and in the future. But we must not ignore the importance of an evidence-based and realistic approach, and that the realistic approach favours an emission reduction target which is 75% lower than the baseline over the next decade. Solutions to deliver the more ambitious 75% target will be focused on a combination coming from all sectors, including industry, transport, each doing what it can. So having increased the target to a level where it was pretty unlikely it was ever going to be met, guess what? It hasn't been met. Patrick Harvey at the recent Greens conference... Last month, the UK Climate Change Committee, the independent advisory body to both Scottish and UK governments, concluded that Scotland is almost certainly going to miss the 2030 climate target. Now, Scotland has had legally binding climate targets for a decade and a half now, a decade and a half. And back at the start of that process, I had the privilege of chairing the parliamentary committee that scrutinised the first Climate Change Act. At first, I was really taken aback by the ease with which consensus seemed to be emerging. There was a strong united civil society demand from environmental organisations, of course, and campaigners, but also from trade unions, from religious communities, from industry, from anti-poverty organisations. That strong united civil society demand was very, very clear. But there was also political consensus in Parliament. Every single political party seeking to make the bill stronger and the handful of outright climate deniers seemed to be left marginalised. But by the time the final debates on that first Climate Change Act were taking place, I felt that the reason for that early easy consensus was becoming clear and I felt that it was actually nothing to celebrate. In the final debate on the bill, I said targets alone are not enough. They are necessary but not sufficient. They will not be achieved without a radical shift in policy on transport, housing, land use, food and energy. We had in fact achieved only consensus of intent. We had in fact taken the easy path of agreeing the targets we wanted to reach, but not agreeing how we were going to reach them. Scottish politics at that time and since had a complete lack of consensus on the actions that would be necessary. Scotland's done really, really well on decarbonising energy production. But that was already happening before that legislation was in place, and it was not accelerated by it. And in other sectors, transport, land use, heating, we've seen 15 years of largely flatline emissions. Now, if successive Scottish and UK governments had taken the actions needed, I'm in absolutely no doubt that we would be on track for that 2030 target. Instead, too many politicians in every other political party engaged in mutual backslapping about world-leading targets 
while at the same time demanding ever more money for road building, supporting relentless aviation growth, lobbying for status quo rural policies to the benefit of big landowners, and cheering to the rafters every time a new oil and gas license was announced. And we would have been decades ahead of where we are now if Scotland had implemented the policies that we as Scottish Greens had been advocating for years. Scotland needs a reset on climate policy. We will have to make fundamental changes as a result of that report, not just to stay within the law, but to shift the emphasis from targets onto accelerated action. Targets do matter, but they matter if we use them to focus our minds on the action. They must never be treated as a substitute for action. So I think Patrick Harvey is absolutely right there. You know, it's important to have stretching targets, but it's important to do the action to achieve those targets. But in fact, what the uh, government has done is instead of having a 2030 target that they now know they cannot achieve, they've removed that target and they're putting all their effort on achieving the 2045 target, which is the same as the Westminster government's target for 2045. And they've refocused their efforts on action rather than rhetoric. But here's Alex Cole Hamilton lining up to kick them in the ankles yet again. Presiding officer, what the Cabinet Secretary describes as a minor legislative amendment is in fact a monstrous generational betrayal from the SNP and their Green partners. It is a cynical attempt to dodge bad press by simply abolishing the climate change targets that they have repeatedly missed. For years, we have had to endure smug lectures from nationalist ministers about how Scotland was a world leader on climate targets, but it is never delivered on the hard graft of insulating homes, making transport cleaner or creating green jobs. They are incapable of getting even the basics right because their nationalism has always trumped their environmentalism. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, given the botched recycling schemes, the rail fare hikes, the bus service cuts, is there anywhere else on the planet where Greens in government have torched climate targets for a seat at the table? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, um, Alex Cole Hamilton's full outrage in the chamber today is utterly true to form. He deserves an Oscar for his contribution. <laughs> uh, a number of weeks ago, he sat with me and with colleagues in Butte House at our invitation and he listened to the Committee on Climate Change give us a very factual uh, lecture and update on the state of play as regards climate. And two key points were made. 75% by 2030 was always regarded as pushing at the limits of what was possible and that annual targets and the measuring thereof don't necessarily reflect how long-term emissions actually happens. He knows this and yet he plays up in the chamber today. What I would say to him is that the, the climate crisis, the twin crises of nature loss, these are too important for people like Alex Cole Hamilton uh, to politicise them. Scotland remains a world leader when it comes to climate change. Yeah. Our 2045 target is absolutely steadfast and we are already nearly halfway to net zero with a significant number of plans in place to continue that journey. So Mary McCullen there fending off Alex Cole Hamilton's attack. But the interesting follow on, though, is that all this has created quite a problem for the Greens in government. Green Party members or certain sections of them have been having conversations to whether the Butte House Agreement ought to be brought to an end. Now, that obviously would mean that the SNP then became a minority government. It would take the Green Ministers out of their roles. It's critical for the future of uh, climate policy in Scotland, which is, uh, you know, the reason Greens are in politics in the first place. It's critical to the future of our party as well. And over the next few weeks, we have uh, probably the most important decision to make that we've, we've ever had to make about the future of our party. And I want to make sure that we're all listening to each other over those few weeks and making sure that we genuinely understand and share not just the sense of urgency, and the deep disappointment and anger about the fact that Scotland is not on track at the moment, but a focus and determination on action. And my worry is that if we, if we walked away at this point, we would decelerate climate action. We would see 
the, the hand strength of the, uh, you know, the likes of Fergus Ewing, uh, backbencher in the SNP now, who's constantly popping up and having a go at environmental policy and urging the, the government to slow down. Just last week, uh, others in Scotland were uh, advocating that the government should slow down on the policy, on the action. That is absolutely the wrong thing to do. And we've just heard this morning that the Greens are out of Scottish government. There's an emergency cabinet meeting going on right now, apparently. So obviously we're not going to have any update for this podcast, but we will come back to this one because there will be fallout. Whether it's a positive move or not remains to be seen. Personally, I'm disappointed that the one thing that Holyrood's done that seemed to be progressive and European seemed to be very vulnerable to uh, bully boy tactics from the opposition yet again. And I suspect the biggest casualties in all this might be the Greens themselves. Who's going to elect someone who, when they had power, gave it back? I don't know. We'll need to see how that, uh, how this whole thing plays out. You're listening to Bits and Pieces. So a bit of a turbulent month in Holyrood. But one thing that happened there I think is really positive. Back in September 2023, the Citizens Participation Committee recommended that the Scottish Parliament should develop its use of deliberative democracy and suggested something called a People's Panel to focus on post-legislative scrutiny. So they set up a People's Panel which consisted of 23 randomly selected individuals and they had two residential weekends and two online sessions considering how effective has the Scottish Government been at engaging the public on climate change and Scotland's climate change targets. So it's, it's not quite as big as the, the full Citizens' Assembly which had over 100 people. This is a much smaller possibly more agile process. So this People's Panel has submitted a report and they were invited to give evidence at the Net Zero Committee and they were asked what their experience had been like of serving on a People's Panel. I find it quite exciting to be asked about it and being asked to join in simply because I work several jobs in several different places. People want me to change things about my house that I can't afford. I'm really not into that. I don't mind helping the climate change and doing my piece that I can afford to do and that I can do. And I kind of feel that there's quite a lot of other people in the country that would be in my position. So I felt it was really important that I took part. I'm a big fan of the concept of deliberative democracy. I hadn't heard of it until I came along uh, to the panel. For this sort of topic, I thought it was an ideal way to engage. I really hope that the pilot panels have proved useful to both the public and the parliament. It will be further rolled out on further subjects. I enjoyed the experience and it's very worthwhile. It's an exciting process to be engaged in and being asked. I I kind of felt like included. Usually people feel a sort of distance from the parliamentary process and so it's, it's a good step. Deliberative democracy, uh, what a gift to the people of Scotland. We had evidence through our sessions of citizens' assemblies and the like, but many of them seemed fairly cumbersome. In the People's Panel, I think we felt representative, represented, relevant and listened to. It's been enlightening, fascinating at times, but most of all uh, a fairly compelling journey through a a democratic process, the results of which we hope that you uh, will find informative, honest and helpful. The reason I came along to this is because I uh, had to retire through ill health and so I needed to do something that would kind of bring me back on board with working for and with other people. I found this an exciting and interesting area because I actually didn't know very much about it at all. I found the whole thing quite enlightening. I'm quite impressed with some of the initiatives that are happening in Scotland. I've learned about recycling, about heat pumps, about how climate targets are not being met at the moment. I've learned that there is not enough information available in primary schools, libraries, community centres and other public areas. I'll put a link to the report in the notes to this podcast and it is well worth having a look at. But I'm also going to play a just tiny little clips that I've selected from the evidence that they gave to the panel. What I loved about this was these are 
ordinary people. This is what they think. So where there was areas where they didn't agree with the government or they don't understand the background or they thought it was they're going about it the wrong way, they just came out and said it. But the contrast between genuinely held opinions by ordinary people, comparing that to some of the misleading, twisting, party, political, motivated misinformation that we've heard several examples of in this podcast, I thought this was a wonderfully refreshing change. So I'll be really interested to see how the concept of people's panels rolls out. You can, of course, watch the entire evidence session on Scottish Parliament TV. But here were some of my favourite bits. The question was, how, how well are we communicating? For me, there was a lot of good work going on that I was unaware of. So clearly it's not being communicated as well as it could be. So I would encourage a more wider celebration of the good things that are going on, rather than only people immediately in that area are, are aware of it. One of the things we found out, that there is a lot of information out there. It's this top-down approach. I don't think... It, it's not that it's not working at all. It's just not working well enough. The, the climate hubs, that's, that's a great resource, resource for you guys. Fund them, for goodness sake, fund them. It, it, it helps people, it gives them that trust to engage at a local level. A consistent positive media campaign was recommended because there doesn't appear to be one just now. There are pockets of good work that's going on. It'll be on the local news, maybe in the local paper. But not everybody is aware across Scotland that these important things are happening. It's about widening the communication rather than keeping it limited to the, the locality where these works are going on. One of the things we did notice was people were saying face-to-face -face communications with people to try, and it's not always, let's go and look at something, let's go and go through the computer and things. I mean, I think there's lots of different opportunities that we could look at, but we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot out there and we can. I think it would be good to harness those things and share them amongst us. The ideas about the community hub is good because there, there's lots there. The funding wouldn't be so much because we can utilise what's already been done. Yeah, I think it's really important that we actually remember that positive messages are more important than negative doom and gloom stuff. So I know climate change is really important and people are very focused on the doom and gloom of it, but I do think we should be really positive about what we are achieving as a country and yes, key areas that are doing really well, but even celebrating the small achievements is really important to the whole country and the whole dynamics of everything. A lot of people would just say, oh, that's it, there's nothing that we can do, we'll leave it, leave it to somebody else to do, deal with it. But I think that everybody of Scotland has got a responsibility to do that bit for future generations of Scotland. Using the arts, you know, music, creating things to kind of demonstrate it, to capture people who wouldn't normally engage in kind of, as I say, written sort of things. One of the things I did notice is one of the, one of the groups in Africa had utilised the grandparents. They have a, spe a special role, it's a kind of matriarchal society and they had the grandparents telling stories about what changes they needed to do and because it was more of a family and a community thing people tended to take it more on board so there was some interesting studies case studies that we looked at that if funding was put towards doing some positive news or negative news, what would happen, some plays, some poems, some artwork, some public space artwork to then bring in children, the education and people who are school leavers or not school attenders, getting them on board with doing some public engagement artwork, anything like that because art does engage and it could be any types of art, dance, drama, theatre capture the older audience, you get to the newer audience and you get the people who'd maybe not want to do anything else but maybe a bit of the black human black comedy. At Central Station they've now got a, a sign up for um, British Sign Language so people who can't hear can actually see what the trains are doing. What's the harm in us having that to do with climate awareness stuff or information up on some of those signs popping up now and again? Using the spaces that we actually already have available 
I spoke with uh, Neil Kermode, who's the chairman of the uh, European Marine Energy uh, Centre up in, in my hometown in Strumness, and uh, his take on it was that we don't really have a, a software or hardware problem, but we have uh, a wetware problem, and that we have uh, a problem with people's perception, getting the message through. We've talked a lot about trusted sources, and I think that, one, that will mainly come not as, on a top-down approach from a bottom-up approach. Consider the funding you're putting in locally. Well, most of the local authorities have climbed officers, use them, fund them. We spoke to representatives from three different climate hubs and all three of them said funding was their major issue because they really couldn't plan ahead for things, they couldn't put in place what they needed because they needed a minimum of three years and they were only getting a one year fund. Maybe take the bus or public transport but for that to happen the public transport has to run where they are needing to go for them to be able to ditch the car. It needs to be cheap enough for them to do it. So it's not cheaper for me to drive my car from Irvine to Glasgow and to park it than it is for me to get a train ticket, which is a bit ridiculous. Which would mean that someone has to oversee where everything links together. So, for example, the mums and dads um, to drop the kids off at schools in the morning. Well, you get free bus travel for kids. And for any kids or young people up to the age of, what, 22? So without being rude, why are we not overseeing that and actually making sure that the bus stops are there for the young ones as well so the parents can just drop them off very safely and there's not a big, huge traffic jam? It's about the connections. Someone actually needs to start communicating with people how people can change their habits. It's the general day-to-day -day things which is going to make a huge difference because the day-to-day -day things is what everybody does. I think it's, it's more about having different options available, having infrastructure for it to function as well. So it's, it's uh, The climate hubs are kind of bringing people together to try and solve local issues relating to climate change so it could be litter it could be pollution and stuff like that but it could also be trying to get businesses engaged with supporting some of the local issues one of our recommendations is that you know if if we're funding businesses then we really should be looking for some payback and they should really be taking on board some climate awareness issues within their business a practical example, when you come off the, into the airport in Kirkwall, one of the first leaflets that you'll see is uh, car share schemes. Obviously, Orkney lends itself to that because the size of the place lends itself to electric vehicles, so we have electric car share. There's got to be other areas of Scotland that that could be introduced into. So, well, I've been at, uh, looking at hubs, and it's very difficult to find. It's only for in Scotland. I just feel that it's needing more advice about setting up climate hubs more fun than a lot of the messaging is around the issues it's, you certainly hear people commenting that they're quite tired of hearing about the issue so i think the issues are in themselves fairly widely communicated it's the positive things that are happening that's missing it's the sharing of the good news stories the negative stuff is all over the news you, you can hardly miss that but the positive stuff scotland has done this this month uh, or this quarter or this year and be proud of it and celebrate the good things that are actually happening if for instance you were in a big building that you could share a heat source pump for that whole building. But the infrastructure is not there at the moment for things like that, but it could be, and that's where investment needs to happen to, to move things forward, because that would be much cheaper than having each and every one having their own um, heat pump. It's all money, isn't it? And people are very worried about their own personal situation. I would say a lot of the people that were there, mm -hmm. of the 23 of us, mm -hmm. most of us were concerned about the impact of we want to do things, we want mm -hmm. to try and tackle this climate change issue. But the things that are holding us back really is the money involved. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. And it's not just the people who are on low income. It's actually a lot of the people who are in that kind of middle area. We're all struggling to you know, pay the mortgage and you know, food prices, everything's going up, so it's becoming very, very difficult. The one thing that struck me as a bit odd was that cheap renewable energy produced in Scotland has to go onto the open market and get sold back to people at gas energy prices. 
it seems crazy. There's a clear differential there. If, if you can produce a kilowatt for X and you're having to sell it back to the public at 3X or 4X, how does that make any sense? Is there a way that Scotland could consume its renewable energy local to where it's generated, thereby not needing to buy it from the market, thereby freeing up money that could then go into other initiatives. There's a significant gap between what we pay and what it costs. We were to give you recommendations how to sort things out and help the, the country, which would include make more available services. So yes, you might be thinking, dude, we cannot make that free for everyone. That's just going to cost a bomb. Is there a way that we can do it? You can make it really reduced, but it should not cost me £10 on a bus to go from Troon to where, and that's for a single. The Scottish Enterprise have introduced an approach uh, aligning business uh, support to targeting their own net zero targets. So, if in, other, in other words, if a business is supported by Scottish Enterprise, then they have to have a credible plan in place to reduce carbon emissions to net zero, but it's only by 2045. I think the feeling was that's too far in the future. It's not accountable enough because it's easy for a business to say, yeah, we can do that and, and we'll put this in place. But we do think where any money is coming from the Scottish people going to businesses there should be some sort of reward back to the Scottish people. So some absolute pearls of wisdom in that I think. We have a new podcast out every Friday and you can get all our back catalogue on our website which is scottishindiepod.scot So what do you think of the concept of deliberative democracy? Ah, You're going to have to let me deliberate on that. (laughs) Okay, thanks for listening everybody. See you next week. Bye now. You've been listening to Bits and Pieces. I'm a piece of it.